Welcome to Untold Stories of Innovation, where we amplify untold stories of insight, impact, and innovation. Powered by Untold Content, I'm your host, Katie Trout Taylor. Our guest today is Dr. Merritt Moore. She's known as the Quantum Ballerina. Dr. Moore graduated with magnum cum laude honors in physics from Harvard and then with a PhD in atomic and laser physics from the University of Oxford. At the same time, she was pursuing a professional ballet career with the Zurich Ballet, Boston Ballet, English National Ballet, and Norwegian National Ballet. She's a Forbes 30 under 30, and she was one of 12 selected candidates to undergo rigorous astronaut selection on the BBC series, Astronauts, Do You Have What It Takes? So today we are speaking with a physicist ballerina astronaut. <laughs> Merritt, I'm so grateful to have you on the podcast today. Oh, thank you so much. It's my pleasure. I'm a uh, wannabe astronaut. So <laughs> that's right. In sure. the working. <laughs> Hopefully yes. one day that will be part of the title. <laughs> That's right. I, I saw, I've obviously, I already know about your incredible work. I have read Goodnight Stories for Rebel Girls mm-hmm. to my six-year-old daughter Aww. at night, and we've come across your story, which is so impactful and powerful. Mm-hmm. And of course, then in doing more research about you, realized that, yes, one of your dreams is to dance in space, right? Yeah. I mean, that was that is the ultimate dream. <laughs> that is, uh, um, I think, after... Pursuing, like I gravitated towards physics and dance um, naturally. And then after I graduated, well, actually right while I was writing up my thesis, there was this opportunity to apply to be one of the 12 selected candidates to undergo astronaut selection process with astronaut Chris Hatfield. Um, And I was lucky to be one of those 12. And it just blew my mind away. And I was like, wow. I hadn't thought about this. Like, this is an occupation that, you know, incorporates both high um, mental rigor and physical strength. So, and I, I'm, I've always been an adventurer. Um, so since then, I'm like, I want to go dance on the moon. Let's go. <laughs> <laughs> yes, absolutely. Yeah. So that only, it, it sounds like that only catalyzed your desire to do that even more. Yeah, for sure. For for those listeners who maybe haven't seen your dance with robots, um, mm-hmm. it is such a moving yeah. and, and meaningful and just sort of an otherworldly experience to see. And I, I'd love to know, first of all, if you haven't, uh, if, if anyone listening hasn't seen it, certainly you need to go research it and look and just watch how dance between Merit and robots changes how we view technology. It's really moving. I'd love to hear if you could kind of take us back in time and and kind of tell us about when you first started playing with this concept of scientific communication through dance. Mm, Yeah, certainly. Um, And I hope that it's um, to expand more to scientific research through dance. Um, So my background's physics and, and then obviously, you know, have my dance background. And when I was finishing up my PhD, um, one of the, I mean, I'd been kind of hiding for the past 10 years, like from the dance world, I pursued physics and from the physics world, I pursued dance. Like I just kept them very separate. And after 10 years of having done four years of physics at Harvard, five years at Oxford, plus the four ballet companies, I was like, why not both? Why can't I merge them? Um, and in, in pursuing that, I think the questions that I, that led me were, I was intrigued by how technology and scientific research could kind of inspire human creativity, um, and inspire new choreography and inspire new movement. And so I kind of went down this rabbit hole, um, and I was started asking these questions. And it's so funny how like the universe kind of throws things at you. So I was asking these questions um, while I was dancing at Norwegian National Ballet. I was performing Swan Lake in La Baidere. And a friend of a friend, I found out, like worked in robotics. And I had to be honest, I was like, can I come in, hang out with the robot? <laughs> so I would go like after rehearsals, in between performances, I would go and and 
just start playing around. And it's, this robot is, is like a six jointed industrial arm, right? So it's, it doesn't have like two legs, two arms. Right. Um, it's just like one weird six jointed thing. I was super intrigued by how it moved and how it could inspire me to create new movement and how I could then incorporate the movement onto the robot um, and was invited by Harvard Art Lab to be one of their first artists in residence to explore this. Um, and the Art Lab is an incredible space where they allow artists, give the artists the re- space to pursue research um, without the pressure of a final performance. So I was given the space to research. Um, and this was January and February uh, 2020, right before COVID. Mm-hmm. And then COVID hit. I was in London and, you know, everyone's locked down. Um, And it was such a a devastating time. I mean, I think it's still quite devastating for the arts and dance in particular. Um, Mm -hmm. And I think when faced with a challenge, I think instantly, well, instantly my brain goes, okay, here we're confronted with a challenge. What, you know, there's, there's a silver lining to it. And what is it? And what am you know, what can I do to push the arts forward? Um, and so, you know, I had to make a number of phone calls to the robot company, Universal Robotics, um, who's, who's wonderful. And I was like, you want to lend me a robot? Um, and they're like, not really. I was like, but actually I think you guys do. And so uh, they finally agreed to lend me a robot. It was going to be just for two weeks. And then it ended up being a month and then it ended up being a couple months. And, and now um, it's, it's a continuation and a really, really wonderful collaboration. And um, yeah, I, I've been having just such a great time pursuing that. Can, can you take us into the science and, and the tech mm-hmm. of, of how you approached choreography? Mm-hmm. And w- was that were you coding the, the robots movements? Were you partnering with other technologists who were supporting that? And what was that collaborative process mm. like? Yeah. So during lockdown, it was definitely a one man show. Well, I would say a one man plus robot show. Um, <laughs> so I would, I would, it, it, yeah, I would have to program the um, choreography um, with various, what they call them waypoints. So you, you set the points that you want the robot to move and then you have to set the speed and you have this bet set like how you want it to curve. Um, and then the hard part is like making it fit the music. And then, and so I'm, I'm they're programming it. And then I've got my iPhone and hitting play on the music, play on the video recorder, play on the robot, like <laughs> play on myself. I'm just like, ah, <laughs> tripping over wires, um, the editing. So all of that was definitely, yeah, it was just me. Like there was sometimes amazing. there wouldn't be, um, it, I was just really fortunate that there was this deserted theater in London and they let me hang out there during this lockdown. But like there were times when it was too dark. And so I'd be carrying this 20 foot ladder to like put the light bulb up on the thing. Like I literally thought it was crazy. <laughs> I was like, you know, like, what we do for the arts, man. <laughs> yeah. um, do you yeah. think, how would that process have been different were we in non COVID times? I, I don't know if I would have explored it the way that I did. And um, I think what, COVID forced us to do is to re-question and reanalyze and redo everything. Um, and so I, you know, I would have been super busy with all the other gigs that I had lined up. And I don't think I would have had months to call up robot companies, um, <laughs> to beg them for robots and nor the time and the space to spend. Cause it would take me hours. Like, so when I first got it, you know, I would spend morning to midnight every day working on it and it, and it becomes easier as it goes on. But in the beginning it was like, well, I don't know, like how on earth am I going to make this six jointed thing look like 
or like resemble the movements of a two-legged, two-armed mm-hmm. human, right? Like it's just, um, so I found it super interesting and like various questions that came to mind were, you know, um, research shows that 90% of communication is nonverbal, predominantly body language. And so I was kind of like, does body language necessarily have to come in human form? Can it also come in in this weird robotic Mm -hmm. form? And so it's just been a really interesting time. Also in pushing the arts, pushing dance. And also it's a wonderful opportunity to work with the best minds in robotic research around the world. So um, uh, one is like, Jose Luis Garcia, who is at Harvard, um, was helping me like make it interactive when I was at the art lab. We've got like great collaborators in India. Um, just like now been working with another company, Robotique, who just sent me like the gripper, like a little hand thing and a what they call like a force co-pilot. So it can remember movement better. So I'm wow. loving this as a yeah, opportunity to investigate research more while yeah. enhancing the art form. And so, yes, because I think often there's that belief that science and art should come together, but the, I think somewhat disappointing um, outcome is that it normally just tends to be art helping science communicate. It tends to be like science communication in an art form, but I think the standard of both tends to drop. So it's the the standard of science tends to drop and the standard of art tends to drop when they're merged together. And I've been super passionate about pursuing these with excellence. Hence I had pursued them separately, but now as I merge them together, I want to make sure that they're enhancing each other and improving each other. Not We're not dumbing both down in order to sure. make them fit together. So it's like, you know, how can my being like, I really want this robot to be moving around the floor who do I talk to? What roboticist do I talk to? How do we like collaborate if it doesn't exist? How do we create it? Um, and also on the arts side, like, oh, like with this new technology, can we create these emotions in this way? Um, yeah, so I'm just really enjoying it's it feels natural in the way that these are coming together. Definitely. I think that story of collaboration is it's really unreal. And that image of you, so, so certainly the collaborative part of it, but also just the, there's so much beauty in that image of you in the theater working hour after mm. hour alone with the technology, trying to un- uncover it and for, mm. the, for the research purposes that you had. I, I think a lot of quarantine times has, have called our creativity into question mm. and yeah it's been a major challenge, I think, for almost everyone to dream mm-hmm. up new worlds when we're so confined. Yeah. And you did. It's such a beautiful example of that. I just oh, wanted to you. reflect on that first. And then I want to dig more into this idea of art as a form of scientific communication versus mm-hmm. um, versus both elevating the other. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So many of the the people who we work with at Untold are coders and technologists and inventors and and Mm -hmm. innovators trying to build new technologies and ideally building those technologies in a way that's deeply empathetic with the people who ultimately will benefit or use those technologies. But um, oftentimes they sort of fall into typical or standardized ways of communicating those mm-hmm. innovations, mm-hmm. you know, focusing on the features or the right. very detailed fact-filled science behind it, really yeah. important. But something that we try to do it untold is like research story frameworks, arcs, patterns, mm. map them into innovation contexts in order to try to more deeply understand how can we push innovation storytelling beyond some of those sort of standard or default approaches. So yeah, anyway, I'd love to hear your perspective on that. And then I have a question, of course, about story in the choreography work that you do, but that's mm-hmm. maybe a, sep- a follow-on question. Okay. Yeah, well, I think, I mean, case in point was um, 
you know, working with Universal Robotics um, and the various robot companies that I'm now working with. And I think initially there was a hesitation, understandably, you know, there's like this random girl keep calling them up. Um, But um, of like what they're like, you know, people aren't going to be buying a robot to dance with. Right. Um, But what, so I think in their heads, they're like, why, I don't know why this is going to be beneficial for the company um, to have these dance, you know, robot dances with the, you know, what is this? Um, But I think what they found is when I started publishing the videos was a, the excitement that came around it, B, the um, viral nature. So like certain videos would get like 14 million views in a couple of days. Mm-hmm. And, you know, something that they would never get with showing the robot lifting a cup, right? Yeah, like, yeah. Um, and, and, you know, their mission in their motto is continually, it's human-machine interaction, human-machine collaboration. Um, but I think there's a lot of fear towards machine or robots. But now I think when um, men and women see, you know, me dancing right next to it, they're like, oh, actually, this girl's like dancing with this robot. Like, how scary can they be? Um, <laughs> so, so, you know, like it's like subliminally kind yeah. of like forwarding yeah. these messages. Um, and I mean, talking about like subliminally forwarding messages, but for me, a lot of my uh, motivation behind this as well is just creating a different image of what it is to be a scientist and yes. playing with tech, right? It's, you don't, doesn't mean you have to be sitting in a corner regurgitating facts from a book. You can be creative. You can be, you know, artistic. You can want to discover tech. Like it's not scary. You can be feminine. You can not be, fe- you know, you can do whatever you want, but just try to, um, I think by creating it, offering a different image than what's typically there, it allows people's imagination to then be like, oh, okay, you know, maybe I can have a robot soccer player or like, you know, like, huh, you know, if it's dancing to Bruno Mars, then maybe uh, <laughs> he can do other things. Yeah, it's really both. It's it's the work that you're doing, transforming what it means to be a physicist and a scientist mm-hmm. and Conversely, the work that you're having the robot do changes our perception of what's possible or what robots are for or or how they're supposed to exist in the world and, and mm-hmm. therefore our perception of them, which may open up whole new areas for different applications in medicine or education or who knows that maybe yeah. wouldn't have even occurred to us had we not seen this softer, more collaborative side mm-hmm. of the technology. And like yeah. you said, this, this sense of fear that, that we often have around AI mm-hmm. and robotics and um, that, that fear of replacing the human. I, I just think when you watch the, the, the movements that you're able to achieve with these robots, it tells mm-hmm. such a deeper and such a different story. It's really, really deeply powerful. It's not surprising how viral it's been. <laughs> uh, thank you. Um, and that's really interesting what you just said of um, that fear of replacing. Because I was like, well, it was just popped in my head now. I'm like, you know what I should do is also show a video of just the robot on its own. Um, because then it's not, it's, it doesn't mm-hmm. work. You know, when the robot's just on its own, you really kind of need both the yeah. human and the robot there. Um, for that image to, to be as powerful as it is. So, yeah. yeah. You know, too, I think there's an emotional, there's an emotional response or catharsis that happens Mm -hmm. when you're watching. There is, um, and I'll link it in the show notes too, but there's research out of Harvard Medical School a few years ago that dancing Mm -hmm. and movement activate our emotional intelligence. Yeah. And that just, this brings that to bear in such a different way. Oh, that's super cool. Yeah, I'd love to read that. So, okay, let's di- dive into this idea of story because mm-hmm. I'm fascinated by the kind of storytelling that you do, mm. again, as a physicist and as uh, as a ballerina. So are there certain, would you say when you're approaching choreographies, is there a certain story or, or story intent or story arc or storyline that you come in with? How does that change over time? Um, 
And so, yeah, if you could just kind of speak to, I, I don't know if you, if you sort of approach your work as a choreographer around story or not. I would, um, it's all new to me. So I think my main intention when I was working with the robots was, I think the best outcomes is when you give yourself the freedom to play. So I've just been at first going in with the feeling of, okay, let's just play and have fun and let's see where this goes. Um, in terms of story, um, I have, I've not actually um, done a full length or a longer dances of story. And so I'm super intrigued by this as well. Like um, I've now been meeting up with a, a friend who's really into poetry and um, reading more about storytelling because that's not my world at all. I've, I've gravitated sure. towards these very um, nonverbal mute activities um, that don't really have like that storyline arc. So it's, it's been an interesting, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's definitely part of my uh, growth. And I, I love how this research and this work is forcing me to explore um, other fields like that. You know, it, it actually, this reminds me, I think perhaps the best way. So f- from my perspective as like a storytelling researcher, mm-hmm. I think what you've done so far with robotics and dance is Mm -hmm. sort of what we call staging. You're setting up the context that helps us all get behind and understand what's possible and sort of the lay Mm. of the land here. And you're right. It it is sort of setting you up perhaps for the now making longer pieces or involving plot in new ways. But, um, but yeah, like right now we're sort of in that, that beginning part of staging this. And I Mm -hmm. think there's still story behind it, but maybe not in the beginning, middle and end kind of traditional way of viewing story. No, but if you want to talk more about this at some point or like anyone in the audience, (laughs) I have have been asked to create a longer version of this. Um, Various like five minute long, 20 minute long, 30 minute long. Mm -hmm. Um, And so that's currently on my uh, list of, of projects. Um, and I find it quite daunting. <laughs> so anyway, oh, okay. I, yeah. I readily am very eager. To oh, hear. I would, I would love to brainstorm. I, obviously Great. this would be, okay. that would be a dream <laughs> to me and my team. Do it. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Yeah. And there's another, there's just right off the top of my head too, mm-hmm. a really fun story framework. This is just one of a million, Okay, but it's fun to play with. Um, it's called Arc of Narrative, okay. and it's a text analyzer. Uh, well, first, it's a theory. So mm-hmm. it sort of looks at story from the perspective of how much time and at what moment in the sequence of the story are we staging uh, mm-hmm. versus progressing the plot versus other functions. Mm-hmm. And so, and then it takes every popular film, or not even popular, just uh, pretty much any film, you can look and see at what point in the film is it doing those different narrative arcs? Mm -hmm. And then you can even put in your own text. Um, Mm -hmm. And granted, it's usually a written form. So I'm not sure, you know, how it doesn't really necessarily work with (laughs) nonverbal. But but yeah, it kind of shows Mm -hmm. these patterns and it traces them on the X, Y axis. And it's interesting. Mm -hmm. So you can check that out to kind of start thinking about that idea. But um, but that's oh, only like one that. you know, story framework of, of a bunch. We're collecting so many right now and we're trying to map them to different moments in the innovation process, which well, takes me... Oh yeah, go ahead. Sorry. I was going to say, is, well, especially if it plots onto our X, Y axis. We like, we like graphs and we like... Oh yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah, <cool. laughs> yeah <Cool>. exactly. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, and that takes me back like can we dig a little bit deeper into that moment where you're trying to work with robotics companies and mm-hmm. maybe the ones who didn't immediately get it? Uh, could you take us a little bit deeper into that moment? How did you, did you have to change your pitch to help them see it? Or was it just one of those things where they had to see the video in order to, and to see its impact on society when it clicked? Or was there another way that you were able to frame it to help them understand the potential value? Well, I think in the beginning, I was just incredibly stubborn. (laughs) 
And I think I messaged everyone on LinkedIn, like <laughs> um, connected with the company. I was like, hey, hi, hi, <laughs> me again. Yeah. Um, There is so much power in that though. This podcast and the fact that you're on it is a testament to us doing that work too. And not being afraid to ask when you believe in something and you really need to do it and understand it. So I think you have to really believe it. And I just, I just really, man, it was what I wanted to do. I was like, we are in a lockdown. I want to work with this robot. I think I can do dances. No one's able to dance, but I think I can do it. Like we're gonna oh, whatever it takes, I'm gonna make this happen. Um and and so I think but you know at first the loan was just two weeks and once the footage started coming out, then I think they were a lot more on board and um and I and I totally understand the hesitation in the beginning because I think it's it's hard to describe something that's in one's head. Um and I didn't even know what I was going to be doing. Um, so it's just been, um, yeah, it's been a journey. And what's fun is it's continuing. Like the artistic side is is opening up, like so many doors on the artistic side. Um, and on the technological side, it's actually kind of hard to keep up. But um, <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, it's been lots of fun. It's really neat. Could you give us some some hints into, you know, future research questions that you're going to be pursuing or 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 mm-hmm. uh, or, or performances or yeah, if you could kind of let us know what you think the future might hold. Yeah, well, I'm definitely intrigued by having it more interactive. So, at the moment, um, so when I was first working at the Harvard Art Lab, we were using these um, VR handsets, just the handsets, not the headpiece, to have to pinpoint in location where I want the robot to go. So it's a lot more interactive and I'm working with the robot as I'm moving. So definitely in terms of research, like wanting to experiment with that more of the real time interactive. During lockdown, it was difficult because in order to implement that, you need a lot of sensors and you need a lot of equipment and, and tech backup. So I just did these dances that are choreographed um, and it's not in real time, but exploring that, like there's Mm. also um, putting the robot on another robot that moves around the floor or um, uh, working with gestures and motion capture. And um, ideally at some point, like with AI. So uh, when I was at Norway, you know, I, I got suited up in the motion capture suit and would dance and that data would be stored to be fed into um, a machine learning algorithm that would mm-hmm. then choreograph new movement. Um, and so like working on like mapping that onto the robot and amazing. Um, so that would, yeah. But I mean, these ongoing research stuff, it takes a while. <laughs> Oh, I'm sure it sounds incredibly complicated. It, it sounds simple as you explain it, but I'm sure the execution is incredibly yeah. complicated. Yeah. yeah. How fun. It, it just it, th- There's so much about this too that makes me think of all of the people who are working in robotics or in other forms of innovation that are sitting at the lab bench and just playing and experimenting and how the movements that you're kind of calling forth are bringing their work to light in so many ways. It's a, there's just this other in my mind too. It's, it's the beauty of sort of bringing the experimental and the, the try and try again and the failures that come with, uh, with having to be playful um, Mm -hmm. as we work to make technologies better. It's representing that in so many ways too. Mm, Yeah. I definitely believe in play and experimenting for sure. One of my favorite lines too, Merit, um, mm-hmm. and I believe it was in your um, London Vogue piece when they mm-hmm. interviewed you, was that you have little girls writing to you and sending you pictures of them with their science goggles and lab coats and a tutu mm-hmm. on. Mm-hmm. And so <laughs> it's amazing. Um, so yeah, well, I think I'd love to end because I, I know you have a lot of work to do, but 
could you share with us as we wrap up some advice that you have for, for young girls um, and, and how they see themselves as uh, and what their lives might be? Oh, um, yeah. Um, the advice I would give is one in particular is like, give yourself time. I think there's so much pressure right now for being immediately brilliant and you know, achieving incredible success in a day. And, or if you're not brilliant right away, then maybe that's not for you and you should be mm. doing something else. Um, and I think there's, well, for myself, like I, I'm one where I enter a room where you give me an activity and I'm definitely not brilliant the first time I try, nor the second, nor the third, nor the fourth, nor the fifth, right? Like it, I'm, I've got a very slow plateau in the beginning and then somehow it all accumulates and then I get it and I understand, but mm. it, that's after months, years of kind of just being happy, being in the room and, and plodding along and knowing that every hour of work that I put in will pay off in the end and just not always as as expected, but it will pay off. And it might be like a year from now, it might be five years from now. So yeah. I think the, I think the, the, one of the big things is like, give yourself time and also, uh, you know, your time's precious, like also value your time. So um, realize when you have, you know, 20 minutes, if, if it's, are you, is your attention going to the phone or is it going to, can you better yourself by going to a book or um, even just daydreaming out of the car, I think is incredibly helpful because um, mm -hmm. that's when, yeah. So it's like giving yourself the space and the time. Is, yeah. Yeah. But yeah. I mean, and, and the, again, yeah. it's that beautiful image as you're saying that I see you in that theater mm. and and uh, for all the the sadness and all the challenges that COVID has brought, there there was this time that that many of us were granted to sort of carve out a new world, and you did. And I'm so grateful that you did. I know the world is grateful, and I'm so thankful that you came on the podcast. What a wonderful way to to spend some time together. And uh, I'm looking forward to sharing this with my six year old. Yeah. And also with the, the larger innovation community, for sure. Thank you so much, Merit. What a wonderful... Thank you so much. And please tell your six-year-old, I say hi. I will. I yeah. will. Where can our listeners find you? Oh, um, I'm on Instagram, Twitter, and website, Physics on Point. Um, and then website is physicsonpoint.com with an E at the end. And LinkedIn, Merit Moore. Um, yeah. That's, that's where I'll be. We'll link to all of that in the show notes and I'll talk to you really soon. Cool. Yeah. Take care. Thanks for listening to this week's episode. Be sure to follow us on social media and add your voice to the conversation. You can find us at untold content.